four, behaviorism, nature versus nurture. In the previous section, I discussed that there are two distinct approaches to the study of consciousness. In the German-speaking world, the psychological school of structuralism saw consciousness as a solid structure, perhaps built or pre-assembled. So to study it, it broke it down into smaller parts, just like a machine or a house. In the Anglo-Saxon world, however, there was a different approach to consciousness, influenced by the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin, the functionalist school of psychology saw consciousness for how it functioned as an adaptive mechanism. For the functionalists, consciousness is not a solid like a house, but very much fluid like a river. In the Russian-speaking world, however, the focus of psychology wasn't on philosophical questions on consciousness, but more on how our behavior can tell us about our consciousness. In other words, how consciousness manifests itself in our actions and behaviors. Do you behave because there's an innate structure telling us how to behave? Or do we behave because we learn to behave due to our environmental conditions? Nature versus nurture is one of the oldest debates in philosophy and psychology. Are animals programmed on an instinctual level to behave in a certain way, or are they capable of learning? This question was one of the very first that early psychologists tackled, and we have come to know it as the behaviorist school of psychology. Behaviorism is one of the most important branches of psychology. Simply put, behaviorist psychologists study how humans and animals behave. Behaviorism as an approach began with animals for the obvious reason. It's a lot easier to carry out experiments on animals than humans. The second reason behaviorism started with animals is that animals cannot talk. So to study animals, you have no choice but to study how they behave. Unless you're a wizard. But behavior is also a more accurate way of understanding humans. Watch what people do, not what they say. Our actions speak louder than words. One of the very earliest experiments that kick-started behaviorism took place in 1890s in Russia, as well as in the United States around the same time. The father of behaviorism is the Russian and his greatest children are American. Ivan Pavlov, who lived between 1849 and 1936, was the son of a priest, just like Wilhelm Wundt, and was supposed to become a priest himself, but he changed his mind and instead studied medicine, which ultimately won him a Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1904. In the 1890s, he carried out a few experiments on dogs, in which he planted a device to measure the saliva secreted when dogs were offered food which he called unconditioned stimulus. In other words, you see food, you know we want to eat it. It is simple association. You can do the same experiment on me, not with dog food, but with pizza. He soon noticed that whenever the dog was not shown directly, but it was implied through other signs, the dog also secreted saliva. In other words, the dogs did not clearly see the food, but they associated certain signs like bell, buzzer, or even light with food, therefore stimulating them to release saliva. This second-degree stimulation he called conditioned stimulus. This conditioned response was a learned response. In other words, dogs were trained to associate food with certain sounds or light or a person. So he concluded that animals were capable of learning as well as unlearning. When the stimulus was not followed by food, Repeatedly, the dogs learn not to anticipate food. We all know the story of the boy who cried wolf. If you repeatedly lie to animals, they no longer trust you. Today, it's known as Pavlovian conditioning, in which animals learn to associate certain sounds, objects, or people with food. Pavlov scientifically proved what humans had done for thousands of years, slowly domesticating certain animals with the promise of food. To sum up, Pavlov's experiments showed that animal behavior can be conditioned through a stimulus that promised food. In other words, the dogs didn't see food, but thought of food when they saw a sign which is nothing but a promise. Someone might do a lot for promise of a free lunch, me included. So we humans are no different from dogs. We learn by association and memory.
While the Russians experimented on dogs, the Americans did a similar study of other domestic animals to understand how animals learn to behave in certain ways. Why or how do we learn the things we learn? Edward Thorndike, who lived between 1874 and 1949, was a U.S. psychologist who did his experiments around the same time as Ivan Pavlov's. The Russian experimented with pets, while the American chose another domestic animal, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean chicken. Thorndike built a series of mazes and led a bunch of chicks to navigate their way through the labyrinth in order to get food. He later carried out more experiments with cats. Instead of a maze, the cats were supposed to solve certain puzzles in order to get out and get food. He learned that the cats solved the puzzle through trial and error. But as they practiced solving more puzzles, the cats also found the next puzzle easier to solve. The more they practiced, the better they got. He concluded that learning is outcome-driven, which he termed as the law of effect. When the animals solve the puzzle, their neural connections increased because the link between a situation and response solidified around that stimulus as a solid answer. But when they failed to solve a problem, their neural connection weakened and those responses were discarded quickly. So learning is heavily solution-oriented. Animals remember good outcomes and forget bad outcomes. Good outcomes were solidify in the brain to reinforce a bias towards those solutions for future problems. In his famous book, Animal Intelligence, published in 1911, Thorndike concluded that animals learn not through insight as they lack rationality, but they learn through simple trial and error. For animals, good outcomes lead to good feedback and bad outcomes lead to bad feedback in the brain. To sum up, Thorndike concluded that in nature, learning is heavily outcome-driven and ruthless. You don't get many chances to make too many mistakes. You either eat or get eaten, which keeps you on your toes when it comes to quick learning. This is evolution 101. Among animals, the quick learners live on to mate and slow learners die out without leaving any genetic legacy. So learning is an adaptive mechanism. But how does learning take place in the brain? In other words, how knowledge and brain matter collide? Is there a specific part of the brain where knowledge is stored? Carl Lashley, who lived between 1890 and 1958, wanted to know how learning takes place on a physiological level in the brain and cells. He removed parts of the rat's brain but noticed that they still retain what they had learned to some extent. He concluded that memory is not localized but takes place in the entirety of the brain. Not only the brain retains learning and memory, but even our muscles keep memories, which we conveniently call muscle memory. Riding a bike is something we do not forget because it's stored not only in the brain but also in our muscles. Lashley concluded that there is no physiological change as a result of learning. In other words, learning is not like photography in which you expose the chemicals to the light to capture a photo. There is a chemical reaction that leaves a mark, but animal brain is not like that. It's far more versatile. Even if you damage one area, the task is taken over by another area. But learning is not just a matter of the brain, but the timing is also crucial. For instance, we all know that younger children learn languages faster and better than grown-ups. It's true among animals too. The first psychologist to study age-specific learning was an Austrian. Conrad Lorenz, who lived between 1903 and 1989, was an Austrian psychologist who studied how young ducklings bonded with their mothers. But when the mother was absent, the little ducklings attached themselves to another duck, a foster parent. But what was interesting for him was that this bonding only happened at a certain age, typically at a young age. This is called imprinting. If the bond happens at a crucial stage of development, that bond cannot be forgotten. In other words, you cannot teach an old dog new tricks, but you can certainly do with younger animals. He concluded that at a deeper instinctual level, learning is very stage-specific or age-specific. 
Just like young ducklings can bond with a foster parent at a certain age, among humans, young people are far better at learning a language than older people. It is perhaps an adaptive mechanism in which our survival relies on how closely we bond with a parent or how quickly we learn the language of the community we live in. It ensures survival. Some psychologists, however, disputed that animals only learn instinctively. In some cases, our learning can override instincts. One of the most interesting experiments was done by a Chinese psychologist. To counter Lorenz's instinct-based psychology, Jing Yang Kuo, who lived between 1898 and 1970, was a Chinese psychologist. He put kittens in the same cage as rats to observe if they grew together and whether cats see rats only as food. Not only they didn't attack the rats, they played together as mates. He concluded that there is no such thing as instinct because cats didn't eat the rats if they lived with them. He argued that instead of finding nature in the animal, we should build nature in them. I wonder what would have happened if the cat was not given food or starved for a while. Would it instinctively eat the rat? But of course this raises the ethical question of deliberately starving an animal. So far we've just discussed experiments done on animals, but not on humans. This changed in America in the 1920s by Sherlock Holmes, sidekick John Watson. I'm kidding, it's a different John Watson. John Watson, who lived between 1878 and 1958, was an American psychologist with a somewhat rocky childhood of his own due to his alcoholic dad and religious mother. Not just that, his career also had a rough patch as he was forced to resign due to his romantic affair with a colleague. While the previous psychologists did most of their experiments on animals, Watson wanted to observe humans, so he found a 9-month-old baby called Albert B. The purpose of the experiment was to find out if they could condition the baby to fear certain animals by accompanying that animal with scary noise. The baby was shown various animals like dogs, rats, monkeys, and rabbits. First, he was shown these animals and objects without the noise. As expected, the baby showed no fear of these animals. Then in the next step, the animal was paired with a loud, frightening noise. This resulted in the baby associating fear with the animals. Although such an experiment would not be possible today, it proved that Pavlov's conditioning applied to humans in the same way. What's worse, little Albert not only associated the white rat with fear, he was also frightened of anything similar to a white rat. So not only can we be conditioned to behave in a certain way, our emotional response can also be conditioned. In other words, the environment a child grows up in has a massive influence on their behavior as well as their emotional response. John Watson advocated parents to take a proactive approach to child rearing, which some criticized as too rigid and factory-like approach. His own childhood must have influenced his work, as later psychologists thought while his findings were remarkable, his prescriptions were not very helpful. With behaviorism taking a firm root in America in the 20th century, it became much closer to Darwinian evolutionary biology that learning is not a luxury but a necessity of life. In other words, our survival necessity is the mother of all inventions and learning. B.F. Skinner, who was born in 1904 and died in 1990, considered the most famous behaviorist psychologist, was an American who, despite wanting to be a writer, turned to behavioral psychology. Building upon Pavlov and John Watson's research, but just like his fellow countryman Edward Thorndike, he concluded that learning is primarily outcome-driven or result-based. Instead of a neutral stimulus like Pavlov and Watson's sound stimulus, he developed a physical lever for the animals to operate in order to get food. His experimental subjects were rats in boxes that had a bar fitted in. When the animals pressed the bar, first out of curiosity or deliberately or accidentally, food would appear. It turns out the rats only continued to press the bar if they previously received food. 
those rats who didn't get food decreased or stopped doing so. So the learning was based on positive outcome. As he continued his experiments while varying slightly, the conclusion was that rats were also learning to adapt to the changes that were happening to their environment. Animals learn to respond to positive and negative reinforcements based on their previous experiences. Not only that, the rats responded to stimuli that reduced their negative reinforcement in the shape of electric shock. It turned out the rats learn better through positive reinforcement than negative ones. So reward is better than punishment, or carrots are better than sticks. Skinner also found that different rats responded differently to different stimuli, concluding that rats' genetic makeup to a large part determine its intelligence or curiosity that favor them in the environment they are in. In other words, nature as well as nurture determine how a person or animal adapts to the environment they live in. Nature is the foundation while nurture is the walls and roofs. Skinner also questioned traditional education by offering a more feedback-based teaching approach in which the teacher and student interact more often, not waiting until the student is done with a project. A more interactive education is more effective. His psychology is known as radical behaviorism, arguing that free will is nothing but an illusion. He even coined the term selection by consequences in reference to Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection, that our behavior is determined by the consequences of our action. It is not a passive learning process, but a somewhat dynamic one in which the subject presses a lever to receive food. In other words, we act and behave in a way that helps us get more positive outcomes and avoid negative outcomes. So to sum up, Skinner continued behaviorist psychology but added a more proactive mechanism in his tests to observe that animals basically learn and respond to positive consequences better. It's all good and dandy to know how we learn based on good outcomes, but an important question is how to unlearn things. So far, we have only discussed how humans and animals learn, but we have not tackled the question how we can unlearn things. Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote about how we can be contaminated by bad ideas and would be awesome if we could unlearn some terrible things. It would make life a bit easier to unlearn bad things we have learned, either voluntary or involuntary. The old saying that once learned cannot be unlearned, but Our next psychologist is trying to show that we can actually unlearn things as we learn things. I discussed in Pavlov's experiments that we learn things by association, but we can also unlearn through association or dissociation. Joseph Wolb, who was born in 1915 and died in 1997, was a South African-born American psychologist who is credited with a new technique in behavioral therapy. He understood that humans cannot be anxious and relaxed at the same time. If someone is relaxed, he's not anxious, and vice versa. He asked his patients to imagine the past events that gave them anxiety. When they showed signs of distress, he would ask them to stop imagining and relax. He would repeat this process a few times, and within a short time, the patient would be reconditioned to associate the distressing events with feeling relaxed. This went against the psychotherapy practice that tried to get to the bottom of the trauma or to root cause to alleviate it. Instead, he focused on the symptoms and associated those symptoms with relaxation in the present. This technique of desensitizing the patient to their traumatic experience allowed reconditioning the brain to focus on the present relaxation, not the traumatic past events. So this went against the grain because in order to treat someone from past trauma, he introduced the past enough times so that patients felt desensitized. In other words, in order to get rid of a phobia, one has to touch the spider. It simply tricks the brain to associate fear or trauma with good stuff. If you add enough sugar to something bitter, it becomes sweet. To sum up, the Behaviorist School of Psychology started with Ivan Pavlov's environmental conditioning experiments. Then the Americans carried experiments on other animals and humans. 
Later on, the Russians focused more on the brain side as they saw psychology part of physiology and the Americans more focused on learning and education. So American behaviorists Skinner, Watson, Wolp, and others concluded positive reinforcements was better than negative ones. Today we associate positivity with Americans and brooding pessimism with the Russians. Behaviorists looked at how behavior was established in animals by restricting or providing conditions for a desired outcome. You can train a dog to behave in certain ways which often goes against their innate instinctive response. While those instincts cannot be eliminated through conditioning, animals have the capacity to learn and adapt to new conditions. So learning is closely tied to survival and adaptation to the environment. So we behave and learn to behave that guarantees our survival. Food is the best way to train an animal. While behaviorism looks at how animals and humans behave on the surface, the human mind is far more complex than simple behavior. There are layers of consciousness that are totally hidden from us. This question of hidden consciousness was a pressing issue in the German-speaking world. In my discussion between structuralism and functionalism, the Germans were more in favor of a structure than a functional mechanism. While behaviorism, which is closer to functionalism and Darwinian evolution, became a dominant approach in psychology in the US, in the German-speaking world, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy dominated that discipline. Two of the most important figures in psychology came from the German tradition of analytical psychology. So they saw consciousness as a complex structure with different layers or chambers. Next, I'll discuss the Austrian Sigmund Freud and Swiss Carl Jung and the beast that is called the unconscious.